My name is Sophie. I suffered from fibromyalgia and extreme fatigue syndrome for about 24 years. Today I'm fully healthy. And now I would like to pass on everything I've learned about health and healing and more to support those who are still on a journey. And this is why I create this documentary series and podcast, The Puzzle of Healing. Hi, I'm here with Anthony Kingsley, the head of the Alexander Technique Teacher Training School, and we're going to talk about the Alexander Technique today. So, Hi. would you like to introduce you and say like, what, what about your background um, as a trainer for Alexander Technique? Yes, yes. So, um, originally when I um, was uh, 18, I went to university to study psychology. That was always a passion for me. I uh, studied human psychology in Birmingham. And um, straight after that, I uh, went to do, to do a master's degree in communications, uh, mass media and communications, and became a TV producer in, uh, in Jerusalem, in Israel. Oh, that is a detour. Did you get there? Television news, <laughs> yes. So that was my, my job after my master's degree. Um, but having always been interested in psychology, uh, I came across, by accident, a book about the Alexander Technique in my early 20s. And um, for the first time I came across an idea that was basically saying the mind and body are connected, mm -hmm. that there's something called psychophysical unity or body-mind. And this really fascinated me because I always felt that my stress patterns and my postural patterns were intimately connected, and that my emotions and my body were connected. And this seemed like a technique that honored that truth. And so I went as soon as I could to London and looked up the author of the book. It was called The Alexander Principle and the author was Dr. Barlow and I went to meet him and he said yes come along and have an Alexander session. <coughs> that was in my early 20s and that started me off on my journey with the Alexander Technique. So and you then um, left Jerusalem to... I was, I was living in London then for a while and I was in, uh, in Jerusalem for a visit before that and then about a year and a half, two years later I was still very passionate about the Alexander mm -hmm. Technique and I decided I wanted to train as an Alexander teacher and there was an excellent training in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to Jerusalem and applied to do a full-time training in the, in the Alexander Technique um, in the early 1980s. Wow. Uh, subsequently, uh, I was still on my passion for all things mind and body, and I was exploring different systems, Eastern systems, meditation systems, spiritual systems, and um, I, after about five or six years after I trained as an Alexander teacher, I did a training as a psychotherapist, so that I could still explore the, 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 the mind-body link mm -hmm. and um, after four years I became a psychotherapist. However, I didn't work full-time as a psychotherapist. After a year or so I realized that I couldn't do justice to both Alexander and psychotherapy mm -hmm. and I chose to stay with the Alexander technique. However, the way I understand Alexander today is very psychophysical. Okay. It's very mind-body and the, the whole idea that the mental patterns or stress patterns or Habitual patterns from history affect our health intimately. Mm. Our physiological health uh, has always been um, and remained a passion for me ever since. And for someone who never heard of the Alexander Technique, how would you describe what it is? Well, like first of all, it's a bit like listening to music. It's very difficult to describe. <laughs> okay. Or seeing a beautiful painting. Very difficult to describe. However, if I had to describe what it is, I would explain it something like the... the, the Alexander practitioner uses hands to guide you into a different mind-body state, into a different condition. Mm -hmm. Most people have everyday conditions of stress, reactivity, fatigue, anticipation of major disasters around the next corner. We call it hypervigilance when you're ready for the next emergency, like living in London or New York. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, life is pretty normal and uh, it's pretty normal to react and get ready for the next drama. And so we're always in this constant state of adrenaline and cortisol, of alertness. And the body represents that, it shows that. It's mm -hmm. like the body's a tapestry of all our emotional and mental conditions. So the Alexander Technique is a way to recover, <coughs> self-calibrate, to recover back 
to a healthy and nat more natural way of being in the world. And the teacher uses hands-on guidance to help you recover your balance. When I spent a morning with you, yeah. I had no idea what's going to happen, so yeah. I experienced a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I was moved like forward and to stand up and That's to sit right. down, and I had no idea what it did. But what I realized afterwards, I had a massive headache in my neck, mm. coming from my neck, and an hour later it all dissolved, yes. and then my tension was gone. Yes. And I have no idea how that happened. Well, <laughs> it's not magic. Um, first of all, the sitting and standing is just a prop. We could have had mm. you walking around a room. We could have you dancing or playing a musical instrument. It doesn't matter what the activity is. But we use movement as a, as a, as a, as a resource for exploring your ways of being, your habits. Mm -hmm. And we all have certain habits that freeze us and compress us and create unnecessary tension throughout the whole of the organism. And through a delicate sort of movement through the Alexander Touch, you're invited into a different condition. Mm -hmm. So say you're going around like a normal London person waiting for the next emergency and it gives you a headache. You come into an Alexander setting and you realize you have an experience with a teacher of stillness. The mind quietens down from its high velocity, its high speed, the addiction to adrenaline and cortisol, the addiction to speed and busyness and thoughts going around 100 miles an hour. And the Alexander Touch brings you back home. And when you come back home, the nervous system quietens down and the body opens up. Those things go together because mind and body are intimately connected. You could even say mind is body, and body is mind. That mind and matter are not somehow separate, unconnected entities. And so you come into an Alexander setting and the teacher uses hands, guidance, to help unravel your everyday condition of toxic stress, of strain, of effort, of pushing and pulling, which is part of our everyday way of being. And because it's our every way, everyday way of being, we feel it's normal. Yeah. We may get symptoms of neck aches and tummy aches and fatigue, chronic fatigues, um, chronic stress problems, breathing difficulties, uh, aches and pains in necks and backs. These are normal things. We just take them for normal. Yeah. It's just part of living in London or living, full stop. But because we get used to them, we don't think that we're doing anything to create it. Now, the philosophy of the Alexander te Technique is very positive. It basically says that you're contributing to your troubles, mm -hmm. that somehow you're manifesting troubles that you're creating through your way of being in the world. And if you can understand that and truly embrace that principle, that our problems are often self-created on some level, then you can start the journey into stopping the creation or maintenance of those very problems. Sure. And if that's what I'm doing to myself and I can learn to navigate back to a balance of mind and body, that that can be more available in my average everyday way of being, if I can actually incorporate and embody a different mind-body attitude of ease and freedom, as opposed to my habit of hypervigilance yeah. and strain and stress, then for more of my day, I'll be promoting my health rather than my disease, mm. my well-being rather than my ill-being. And oh. it can be learned. Oh, yeah. That's would be my That was your question. experience. That, that was my experience, yes, definitely. Yes. And my next question would just be, how long does this learning take? How many sessions would you say somebody typical living in London would yeah. need before those patterns That's are That's a good question. Really I'd say at least a lifetime and maybe many more. <laughs> And how many times for that would I need to come and have an Alexander Technique session with you? <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll, I'll try and be, a f be fair in, in my answers. I, <laughs> I do agree though. <laughs> yeah, I think most people, it's not going to be a, a total professional lifestyle choice. It's, it's going to be, I want enough sessions to help myself. Mm -hmm. If I get so excited and intoxicated by the Alexander Technique, I might do a full-time training, which is what I do in this building upstairs, which is three years. But the average punter, the average person wants a practical solution to a practical yeah. problem. And for them, I would say they would need a minimum of 
20, 25, 30 mm -hmm. sessions, individual one-to-one -one sessions, mm -hmm. where they can learn through experience of the Alexander Touch to come off their habits of distortion, the habits of stress, the habits of compression, the habits of pushing and pulling, the mental habits of effort and strain, and to return and recover a state and a way of being that is more harmonious. That is not going to happen within one session, but you felt a benefit after being with us just for, yes. for an hour. But that benefit won't last. In other words, although, although you've navigated back to a condition of ease and you felt the releasing of your neck and the easing of the pain, you won't have installed your ability to navigate back to that condition of emptiness and ease by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you have enough sessions to give you a fighting chance, a better chance of recovery. Because Alexander's all about recovery. It's not like learning X, Y, and Z. It's helping the body do what it's designed to do, mm -hmm. which is after a crazy period or a traumatic moment, we heal, we recover. Alexander doesn't do anything other than nature. We support what nature already wants you to do, which is recover from whatever you're doing that keeps you away from recovery, yeah. the habits that keep you away from recovery. So over time, one session, 10 sessions, 20 sessions, 30 sessions, you have the experience of navigating back to a recovery phase where you self-heal, you self generate or regenerate your ability to come back to a stillness and an ease and a poise which is your birthright that but it takes it, it takes time yeah. because most of us have lost that ability but you know very well with children if you if you take a lollipop away from a two-year-old baby child what will the baby do oh it will scream its it, head off it will scream its head off <laughs> right now that's not a problem, is it? It's normal. Yeah. <laughs> what happens if you give the baby back the lollipop? Immediately happy. <laughs> Bang. Smile comes back. That's recovery, isn't it? Now, most of us, when we get a, a bit older, the lollipop gets taken away in life. Our life's lollipop. We may not scream and, you know, fall on the floor and kick and stamp. We might. <laughs> it might be our version, the adult version of. <laughs> yeah. But what happens is we do react, but we don't recover so easily anymore. Mm. In fact, often we stay in that place of reaction. And the ability to recover, the ability to come back to that balanced resting state, to that homeostatic state of peacefulness, has somehow been lost along the way. Yeah. And then we can get ill. Yeah. Illness comes from the lack of ability of the organism to recover. And so we need help to help the, the natural system that we're born with. Alexander didn't invent biology. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been impressive. <laughs> it would have been impressive. It is he supports. amazing he, what he did invent. He invented there. a system to support biology, to support organic health, mm -hmm. to help recovery from the deviations from organic balance through a learning process. What I'm really interested in is the emotional aspect of it because what I experienced mm. for very long because everybody wanted to help me, I was not ready to accept help and I was not ready to take on anything and mm. I realized I spoke to quite a few people who are still suffering from illness and I feel there is quite a resistance after you tried enough things that failed. Mm. Do you have any ideas or input for people who kind of think like, oh, but that's another thing that maybe takes time and then it would fail. Like how, how could, what would you say someone yeah, who's skeptical yeah. or to get them ready to give yeah. this a go? Well, I think you've hit on something very important. When you've been disappointed, when you've been promised the earth and disappointed over and over and over again, it's absolutely natural to be cynical. Yeah. I wouldn't expect anything else. And I'll be the last person that says, well, I'm the only game in town. Come to me and I'll promise the earth. I wouldn't promise the earth. I'd say, let's work. Bring your skepticism. 
<laughs> along with yourself, <laughs> come along for a session. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to promise you anything. Maybe I can help, maybe I can't. But let your experience be the guide. Not me selling you Alexander Technique or selling you my hands. That's not going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yes, I would expect you to come with your skepticism, with your doubts, with your fears and your hopes. You'd be afraid of hoping because you'd be afraid of your, fear, your, your, your hopes being dashed. So I'd say, come with all of that, all, of, all the thoughts and feelings you have. That's just you. And we'll work with that. We'll work with that without pushing you into some attitude change, which wouldn't be very helpful anyway. Mm. So you bring what you are. You bring, in that very moment you come to an Alexander session, you bring your hopes and dreams and disappointments and fears and anxieties. And the teacher, if they've got experience, holds all of, all of that in the room with you. Doesn't push you to change them. Doesn't say you're going to have to believe in this for it to work. Not at all. Let's just work. So is in the education uh, a big element of psychology in it then as well? Well, in formal Alexander training, there's been absolutely no psychology, formal psychology in Alexander training. Um, it's been much more of a skill-based apprenticeship model. Um, I fundamentally believe that at the core of Alexander is very much a, a therapeutic system, an educational system and a therapeutic system combined. And so emotional health and emotional healing, I believe, are very much part of the Alexander process. But we don't talk about this very much because historically the Alexander technique grew up in the Victorian times where people didn't really talk about thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. They talked about poise and posture and release of muscular aches and pains and that's been very much the way Alexander has been pretty much <clears throat> until today. But I've been working on a, a model of the Alexander Technique which is a model for emotional healing and mm -hmm. I've been doing this for the last 10, 15, 20 years since I finished my, Alex my, my psychotherapy training. <clears throat> and I do very much believe that the technique is potentially a very powerful tool for emotional processing. Mm -hmm. And would you approach that somehow different than to someone who just comes purely with stress or versus somebody who really have like deeper mental health issues? Or I don't, how does it it's, it's not like I will do a different technique for that person and that. It's that a person brings in a different self mm -hmm. and I'll work with a different person. Um, it's not that I change significantly or the way I work significantly changes. It's that what comes up in a session will be different from one person to another. Everyone's an individual. And an Alexander teacher has to be a bit of an artist and not think that they paint from the same palette every single session. We don't. Everyone has their own tapestry. And we have to work with whatever presents itself in the room. And how do you start it if somebody comes in? Do you first have a conversation or you do, do you, does the yes. body tell you things or does the person tell you things or well, a mix of both? Well, I think the second a person walks through the door, you get a, a sense like you would also. You get mm -hmm. a sense of a person. Their body language is already talking to you before they say hello. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have a, a first impression. Uh, you have a chemistry sensation. Are they likable? Do you feel a natural warmth to them or not? Are they coming in in a rather provocative manner or an amenable manner? You know, all of these things will hit you when someone walks mm -hmm. through the door. You can't avoid it. They have a tone of voice. They have a, a demeanor, a way of being. They might come in and straight away tell you about all their aches and pains and problems. Other people may come in in a very private, and it doesn't matter how a person comes in. But what I always do is I tell a person that I'm here to help them, that they can do nothing wrong, and there's no expectation on them to succeed. I start off in the way that I want to carry on, which is they are only here to learn from me, from the technique, and there's no expectation on them to succeed in any way, shape, or form. Mm. Why is that so important? Why do you think that would be so important? I guess expectation already triggered to wanting to make it good right. and right. But now, but when you already get so show me that. So when you, if I say to you now, you're really going to have to really work hard with me and really get what I'm trying to say. 
and you say, okay, show me how I'm going to get it. Yeah. That's, what's that going to do to your stress levels? Uh, immediately, it immediately rises. Immediately it rises right up. Yeah. If I say to you, you know what, Sophie, you're sitting here, I'm going to work with you. I can offer what I offer and there's no expectation or desire for you to achieve anything at all and you cannot fail in this room. What does that do to your stress levels? For me, it goes down. <sighs> I can also imagine for yeah. some people that this is quite difficult. It's not an easy game. <laughs> some people want to be told what to yeah. do. And if they are like that, coming into an Alexander session without a finger wag is going to be quite a, an emotionally demanding session in a paradoxical way. Yeah. Some people like to be told off. I won't tell them off. But they're expecting it. They want me to be like a... A Russian ballet, ballet uh, <laughs> teacher, you know, finger wagging. Yeah. I can't help that. <laughs> I'll just have to be Anthony. But some people have expectations and they want sternness. They want to be told off and told what to do and told to get it right and told a technique and then told to remember it and do homework for it. Mm. Go away and try really hard. But the beauty of the Alexander technique is that the trying mind got to get it right, is the problem. Yeah. That is the problem, and it is not the solution. This attitude of, I've got to get it right. Teacher, please tell me, what's the answer? What do I have to do with my neck and my spine? And what do I have to do with my shoulders? Give me an answer. That attitude is the problem. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. And so if the trying mind is the problem, and I can introduce them to the experience, that the non-trying mind is the solution, that is a different game. Yeah. It isn't usual, you're right. It may be a very challenging experience because to be told that there's nothing you have to try hard for, in fact, if you try hard at this game, it's not gonna get you anywhere, quite the opposite. It'll make you even more stressed out. Especially because we, since childhood, have the opposite program. You yes. need to do good in school, you need to learn. Try, you need to, yeah. and if you don't succeed, you try harder. Exactly. And in Alexander, if you try harder, you increase and magnify the very problems you've brought through the door in the first place. So you have to start a good Alexander lesson the way you intend to carry on, which is actually all you're trying has got you into a pickle. Mm. And we're here to develop something called non-trying. Ale Alex Alexander called it non-doing, mm -hmm. often misinterpreted as doing nothing, yeah. <laughs> but it's not. Non-doing is an attitude where I can remain reasonably still in my mind and body and still be in the middle of an activity. Even playing match point in tennis can be an attitude of non-trying and non-doing. Mm -hmm. If I can follow through and not snatch at the critical moment when the ball's about to hit the racket and I fluff it because I'm trying so hard to get the ball in the right direction and return a serve of 140 miles an hour. You know, that sort of stressful reaction is the problem. But if I am able and I've developed in myself a resource for what Alexander called non-doing, then in that moment, which is happening so quick I can't even compute or think about it, like Federer, he has all this naturally. You know, do you know Federer, the tennis player? An ab Don't absolute okay. genius of tennis. If you're a natural, it's amazing to see these artists of sport, the artists of music, the artists of dance, do their thing. It's, it's a beauty to withhold, to, to, um, to, uh, to observe. Absolutely amazing. It sounds a bit like, because of that, Alexander Technique is kind of for absolutely everyone, or is there condition or a situation where you said it would not work or be useful? Oh, I wouldn't like to rule anybody out. Of an, I'm not saying Alexander's for everybody. I think for the reasons you say, the idea of learning non-doing or non-action, a quality of surrender to non-effort and non-striving is a challenge too far. Mm. But I would say those are more psychological challenges, but I'm happy to work with a person who's 90 or 9, mm -hmm. a musician, an office worker, a pregnant woman, a person who's just had a, a, an accident, a broken hip, uh, everyday stress in necks and shoulders, headaches, breathing difficulties, vocal problems, 
doesn't matter to me. No one should be ruled out of recovery because why should Alexander be seen as universal? Very simple, because Alexander only supports nature. So if it only supports nature, everybody who's natural, who's, who's organic, who's a human being and not an alien, or not a machine, everybody can benefit from the Alexander technique because a good teacher will simply support natural healing. Alexander teachers aren't healers. We don't have magic potions. We're not homeopathic remedies. We work with what is and help to amplify the very natural conditions that we're born with that support healing. How do we do that? By removing the obstacles that don't support healing. <laughs> it's very simple. If it does harm, stop it. Mm -hmm. But not because you've read it in a book. That's not enough. Do no harm is a beautiful thing to hear and to say. But for most of us, you need to be shown. Yeah. You need to be shown what do no harm means in practice. In practice, in real time. It's not enough to read it in a nice self-help book. Do no harm. People can be very inspired by self-help books. The beauty of the Alexander Technique is that it gives you the experience, like you had, mm -hmm. of non-trying and non-efforting and coming back to stillness. And without it, there's no point in talking about it, really. And then I guess you also just feel like once it's in your body and when you can say, OK, cool, my body learned it. I think your body-mind learns it because I think it's a mind-body attitude. Uh, uh, you could call it equanimity or a, a quality of peaceful, peacefulness in the, in, the, in the mind coupled with a poise and a, an energetic flow of vitality in the body. Either the two things are together or neither of them are, are true. So Alexander's very self-checking. If the mind is in the right condition, the body's in the right condition, and vice versa. You're not going to have one without the other. I find that very interesting because I made a bit of a different experience. For me, mm. I realized the mind and the body have different, or in my case, it had a different tempo. Mm -hmm. So when I finally found the last element that healed me, my mind couldn't cope. And I suddenly almost created the same mechanism I had learned to cope with an illness. And I still fought for something every day until I realized I don't have to fight anymore. And that was a long process, even though my body didn't need it. So I found that interesting, that it can be, at least in my case, it wasn't yes. the same speed. It may feel that's the case. Mm -hmm. And I certainly um, hear your experience. But what you'll find is when your mind is saying, no, I'm not quite ready, there'll be some sort of obstacle at the same time in the body, which will also oh, yeah. be blocking. Yeah. That's what I mean by mind-body mm -hmm. unity. But I agree there may be a, a, what seems like a lag between one or the other. They may not be almost inviting the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like a bit like your mind might say, I want a cheesecake, and your body says, you know what, I've eaten enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm not saying it'll always feel the same. <laughs> However, if there's an overreactivity in the mind, and you're getting very reactive and disturbed by something that's going on in your personal life, somewhere, somehow, the body will manifest that reality because it can't not. Yeah. And if, if you think about neuropsychology, which is the interface of mind and body, neuroscience, if I'm producing a stress reaction to something, that's going to evoke adrenaline or cortisol stress hormones, and that's going to affect my body. It's like there's no hiding place. Yeah. It can't be anything else. And as you know, the happy hormones, which are produ produced by feeling good about yourself, affect the body in very powerful ways and can reverse many illnesses. And we know that too, and yeah. I'm sure your experience tells you that. Oh. Yeah. There have been very, very interesting examples in the medical world where people have been very, very ill, chronically ill. I think Norman Cousins is a very good example. Have you come across him? Wrote a wonderful Not book yet. called Anatomy of an Illness. When he, was, he had... About that book, though? It's a wonderful book, and he was very, very, very sick. Um, with chronic inflammatory, uh, a chronic inflammatory condition in, throughout his whole body. And he was on his last legs in a hospital bed. And they said, um, anything you need? And he said, no, but I wouldn't mind watching some films 
and they brought him some Marx Brothers films. And he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. And his inflammatory condition remitted. <laughs> now, okay, so that's not medical science. It's not a controlled research model. It's one person. Yeah, but I don't think it's beyond any doubt at all. It's, it's so obvious, isn't it, that the, yeah. the, the mind condition and the body condition do, do reflect each other. Exactly, and I think because healing is a puzzle, everybody needs it to is find a puzzle. what element is it for me to That's calm right. down my nervous system. That's right. That's and, right. Um, or waking up the nervous system, because some what, people, what? after chronic fatigue, it's not so much the calming down. Sometimes in chronic fatigue, there's like a, a deadening of the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Almost like there's no energy left, because it's been so toxic for so long and so speedy, the, the mind body says, let's have a holiday. Yeah. It goes into hibernation, like, ah, oh, like chronic depression, chronic fatigue, they're quite allied. Oh, and for certain people, it's not so much how do you quieten down, yes, mm -hmm. something needs to quieten down, but something also needs to wake up. And that does work as well with it, the Alexander technique. Al guys. Alexander doesn't decide whether you need to wake up or wake down. Yeah, <laughs> just coming back to it's, the it's, center. It's whatever is appropriate for you at a certain time will happen. So a person that comes in with a collapse will come out of an Alexander session with more alertness and aliveness and poise. A person that's hyper, manic, will find themselves experiencing much more of a quietening and a grounding because that's natural for them. Yeah. It's, it goes where it goes. Uh, it reaches the parts that are designed to be reached <laughs> in its own way. That's incredible. But you don't make a decision. The Alexander Technique teacher doesn't think, you know what, you have to do this, 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 and this. In a way, you have faith as an Alexander teacher that the right thing will happen by itself when the habitual patterns of deviation and distortion are prevented. So at the highest level, the Alexander Technique is the art of prevention. It prevents the habitual and ongoing interference with the organism. And when these preventions are sustained, healing takes place to the highest level. Self-healing, self-regeneration. Does, does that make sense? To me, it makes sense, yes. Yeah. <laughs> is there any last input you would give to someone who is ill, looks for solutions, wants to try that out for the first time, anything that comes to your mind you haven't said? Well, I think it's really important, as you were touching on before, to recognize that health is a puzzle and illness is a puzzle. And maybe we'll never fully understand all the jigsaw puzzles mm -hmm. that make up health or illness. And many people need to explore other elements in their lives and lifestyles, their quality of relationships, their psychology, their history, whether they exercise in fresh air, their diet. There's so many elements of health, as you say, many, it is a puzzle, but some of the elements of a puzzle are worth thinking about. The Alexander Technique sits side by side with all of those things. It doesn't say, you know what, do Alexander, don't do exercise, don't, <laughs> don't, you know, you can eat McDonald's all day and everything will be perfect. It's saying all of these elements can support health. However, what the Alexander Technique does is it sees that whatever else you're doing in your life, there may be some ongoing toxic patterns of behavior, your ways of being in the world, your habitual patterns that 24-7 are eroding your health. And so you may have another, an hour of yoga, an hour of meditation, which is helpful. But if the other 23 hours are spent doing down to yourself, compressing yourself, being reactive, being overly vigilant and busy and trying and striving in your mind and body, then those other things are not going to have so much effect. Mm. As part of an overall health system, they can be wonderful, but you must, I think, look to yourself and say, what am I doing to myself that is causing and sustaining my problems? You have to really be honest with yourself and saying there may be aspects of the way I am with myself, the way I walk and talk and engage, 
and chop vegetables and do the vacuuming and do sport or engage with people. There may be things that I'm doing on a daily, moment by moment basis that are contributing significantly to my, to my ill health. And if that's true, and it's true for most of us when we reach adulthood, then I need to primarily look at those aspects of me and see if I can get help in removing those ongoing toxic elements to my lifestyle and my behavior. That's a beautiful ending, I think. Good. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>